I think we're ready to begin. So once again, welcome. My name is Stephanie Thomas, and I am a disability fashion stylist. And if you've never heard of any such thing, it's because I made it up many years ago because I had to create something that would empower me to assist people with disabilities and their caregivers to help them dress with dignity and independence. So I wanna start with something because this is gonna be a lot easier to start this way, kinda get you loose and get into the presentation. So can all of you stand up for me just really quickly? Sorry if you've just gotten comfortable. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, you can have a seat now, thanks. So I know everyone's awake, everyone's ready to go. But can you tell me, what is the first thing you did when you stood up? Did you adjust any, any bit of your clothing at all? Yes. yes. Did you do that? Yes. Did you kind of, kind of shift things around? So when I start to talk today about dressing with a seated body type, that's exactly what I mean. Because the clothing that we wear is not designed for someone who sits all the time. It's designed for people who ambulate with our legs just, you know, not sitting. And so I wanted to get that out of the way. And I also wanted to tell you that I'm really thrilled to be here, especially in the context of fashion and technology, because technology has really changed the game for people with disabilities. And we're gonna find out how. I have 15 minutes set aside for Q&A, so I'm gonna get started. Disability fashion styling, yes. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, so I wanna answer four questions today for you. The first being, what is disability fashion styling? The second, what are the myths surrounding fashion customers with disabilities? And the third, why tech is a game changer? And finally, what can you do to meet the needs of fashion customers with disabilities? So disability fashion styling. I'm based in LA and I was on the East Coast. I lived on the East Coast in the United States and I sold my home and everything that I owned to move to LA because I knew that media images were made in LA. And right now I work exclusively with KMR Talent, which is the only talent agency in LA. It's been around for 30 years, but it's the only talent agency in LA that has a diversity department. So I work with all of their clients that dress with disabilities. So my, I have clients now that are on Broadway, that are on TV shows, that this is what I do because that's where the image is and that's where the change is made. So that's a little bit of my background starting out. Why did I become interested in disability fashion styling? Well, you may not know it from me standing here in heels, but I was actually born without all of my toes, and they didn't even think that I would walk. The doctors, sometimes they're wrong, fortunately, because I love heels, but the doctors were wrong. As a matter of fact, the toes that are needed on both feet that give you balance, I don't have those. And so I've basically been a disability fashion stylist all my life without really knowing it. And what I do is I have to figure out a way, which I'll share with you a little bit later, in order to wear shoes that I love, that complement my style, but will not cause harm to my body. Which brings me to the disability fashion styling system definition. There are three major points. It should first be accessible, easy to put on and take off that's with or without a dresser. Do you guys know what I mean when I say a dresser? Yes. Sometimes people with disabilities may have more severe disabilities than others, and they have someone that assists them. The second is medically safe, and I refer to that as smart. Disclosure, I came up with this in 2004. We weren't using smartphones the way we are today, so you're like, smart, that's not the same thing. Trust me, smart, not silly, not silly, not gonna cause harm to the body. That's what I meant by that. And then fashionable, something that's loved by the wearer, fits their body type, and it complements their lifestyle. Really important, because that's often what's overlooked when it comes to dressing with disability. People often think, is it functional? No one ever asks, what's your favorite color? What's your lifestyle? What do you like to do? And that prohibits fashionable clothing for people with disabilities. Do you know of any brands that are fashionably made for people with disabilities, anyone? All right, don't all raise your hands at once. Well, 
Tommy Hilfiger has actually joined the game two years ago. And the fact that you don't know about it is why I'm still doing my work. Because it's not public knowledge. It's been around since 2015. They've even just recently expanded it to young adults. But Tommy Hilfiger Adaptive is really helping to make a change for clothing for people with disabilities. So let's break down accessible. I told you that it means easy to get in and out of. But that's going to mean different things for different people. So for a little woman who is oftentimes probably about here, and I'm not very tall, but they're usually, I have an intern, she's, Drew comes to about right here on me. Drew is a young adult. She's 26. She wants to go out. She wants to have cute shoes, but most of the clothing that she has to wear is designed for little girls. Someone who is living with Down syndrome has a different body type. So accessible for them is going to be very different because there's usually a pooch right here and the hips are a bit rounder. And it also, someone that is a gentleman that may be using a wheelchair, the circumference of their neck is going to be a bit wider because they're constantly building those muscles to... So that's going to mean something different for that person. So thinking in terms of who the person is, it has to be very specific as to what will constitute accessible, easy to put on and take off. Now when it comes to this, this for me, and I just have full disclosure, most of the people that I even dress in LA, they are more willing to wear clothing that could kill them, literally, I'm not being dramatic right now, then wear something that's accessible. Because the pants, if any of you have jeans or anything with thick seams, those seams can actually rub on the body of someone with paralysis. They won't know it, cause a body sore, that body sore gets infected and they die. So people are literally dying to be beautiful because clothing is not designed that is medically safe. I wanna share something with you just to kinda of give you context. In the States, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act that's turning 27. I've been following clothing trends for people with disabilities for 25 years. And still today, while I'm on this trip in Europe, I'm going to Germany to Roly Moden, the only store that I know of in the world that has a store set aside for people that are wheelchair users. That blows my mind because we have all of this access in the States. We're like, yay, ADA, ramps, everything. Can you imagine? I just want you to stop one second and imagine going into your favorite store. Are you there in your mind? Okay, imagine nothing in that store being designed for your body type. And then you have to make do. And you go to work every day. You have money that you want to spend. You want to give your money away. So that's a bit of a peek into their world. And fashionable. Fashionable, I'm gonna take it back to you again. Imagine not having choice. You get up in the morning, you go to your closet, and you wear what you have to wear, not what you want to wear. Have any of you ever gone to school and had to wear uniforms? And you're just like, oh my gosh, I hate this uniform. I can't wait to get this uniform. And then you have that day at school when you don't have to wear the uniform and you're like, yes, no uniform. And then you get to express yourself. A lot of that's missing for people with disabilities because a lot of their expression is confined to function. So let's, let's do something really quick. This is from a photo shoot I did in LA. The gentleman that's standing He's actually a bow tie designer. And everything that the, that the gentleman that's sitting is accessible. His denim is made for the seated body type, which means that it's gonna be higher in the back and it's actually gonna be longer. The pockets are gonna be lower because have you tried going in your pockets when you're seated, you're all doing this. So that's fully accessible. The top that he has on is a magnetic closure so that if he has dexterity challenges, he can get in and out of that top without any difficulty at all. We put the bow tie on, but it was only clip on. It wasn't really serious. But I thought it was a really good juxtaposition with the designer because I just like to show the fact that people with disabilities can be fashionable. Something else about this set, other than the tie and the bow tie designer just putting it on him, 
it's not something that he had to have help with. Dignity and independence when dressing, super important. Because you getting dressed in the morning, having to wait for someone to dress you, hello? You're like, really? Can I just make this happen? It's a part of your self-efficacy. It defines who you are as a person in many ways. This is also a universally designed piece from the same photo shoot. And Katie's wearing a dress that has no zippers, no fasteners, nothing. So it is universal. It's not necessarily adaptive because anyone could wear it quite easily. This one I picked up at Target. But using the disability fashion styling system, I make sure that it's accessible, smart, and fashionable because Alana is an equestrian and she's able to use her dexterity. There are no buttons, no fasteners, nothing, so she's able to get into that quite easily. And so I'm trying to give you different examples of what it means to have accessible, smart, fashionable choices and decisions and to be able to make those. And for photo shoots, I know we see a lot of people on the runway. You see people with disabilities on the runway. A lot of times when clients bring me in, especially in LA Fashion Week, they'll have someone with tetraplegia changing on the floor because they didn't take 10 minutes to grab something for them to transfer on. So it's beyond just a, being a prop on a runway show. It's making sure that there is independence and that there is dignity. Most of the time at this point, whenever I'm talking about this, people kind of get this look on their face like, man, I feel bad. Don't feel, this is not about pity. This is not about guilt. You didn't do anything. Can I just stop and kind of go there? Because sometimes people kind of close their ears to what I'm saying because they're thinking of other things. This is just to inform you. I'm taking you on a journey into my world, so I appreciate you joining me on this. We're gonna get to fashion, but now you get to talk. Yay! What do you see, guys? I, there's no wrong answer, by the way. Cool. Yes. He looks cool. What else do you see? That is correct. Jordy will like that. I will tell him that you said he looks cool. He'll be very happy to hear that. What else do you see? He's obviously a what? Yeah, using a wheelchair. You see anything else? If you had to use accessible, smart, fashionable to dress Jordy, what do you think you would keep in mind? The wheelchair. Would there be anything else that you'd think of or keep in mind? Just, there are no wrong answers, anything? Yes, sitting position. You're actually like in my head. You're in my head because that's absolutely right. Because Jordy does not have a back injury. A lot of people that use wheelchairs don't have spinal cord injuries. So sometimes if you see someone in a wheelchair on Instagram and then you see them kind of propped up on something, they may be like Jordy who live with CP, cerebral palsy. There may be someone that has something else that's caused them to have to use a wheelchair to ambulate for long distances, but they can actually stand on their own, which will make a huge difference in what I'm able to dress Jordy in. So I can actually put Jordy in slacks that are not adaptive because Jordy won't get body sores because he can be in and out of his wheelchair. Does that make a little sense for you? And everything was correct. He ambulates with his chair. Jordy grew up in Jakarta. He speaks Korean. He speaks several Eastern languages. And having grown up in that area, there was a different sort of taboo attached to disability. So he is not as connected or proud of his chair as most people that are just kind of used to using it. So his position in the chair was very important to note. Other considerations when styling and thinking about the disability fashion styling system and dressing people. Garment construction. I went back for a second graduate degree in fashion journalism to learn everything I could about fashion and writing and garment construction because my first career is in television, media. I didn't know anything about garment construction, not in the way that I should. I sewed as a little child, but I didn't really know what I needed to know to understand that. And that's gonna help you because then you'll know. Do you guys know dome and sleeve, right? Dome and sleeve, let's see. Uh, 
kimono. Yeah. That's more universal. So kimono. Any of you ever go to the gym and hurt your shoulder? Like you can't lift and it's just difficult? Well, if you're wearing something like this, what kind of sleeve is this? It's an inset sleeve. So an inset sleeve restricts your ability to get in and out of it, especially with a difficult shoulder, right? So you'd want to go to something that has a bit more of a flowy or kimono. And there is another, there are a lot of trends that are out that have dropped shoulders for guys that if you hurt that shoulder, that's going to be a better deal. And if you have to go to work and wear something more I'd say more professional, that's always an option. So that's why knowing garment construction for me was super important. Another consideration is understanding various disabilities. And this isn't something you learn from a book. This is something that you actually learn from talking to people, getting to know people, being around people, getting it wrong, asking questions. And that's the beauty of this that I can share with you. People want you to ask questions. It's like my locks, right? So I've had locks for 12 years. Obviously, I've cut and let them continue to grow. But when people ask about locks, they don't know if they're braids or if they're sister locks. or if, So what do they do? Before they touch it, mm -mm, don't touch the hair. Before they touch it, they ask me a question. Oh, are those braids? Are those locks? Is that your hair? OK. I own it, it's mine, but this happens to be grown out of my skull, so yes. And no, they're not braids. You get where I'm going? There's no offense when you ask a question. We all have something about us that makes us special and different. And unless people ask, they'll misinterpret. Maybe it's your ethnicity, maybe it's your age, maybe it's your career. We all have things about us that make us different. And we feel better when people ask, right? not just make an assumption. So don't be afraid to ask, talk to people. They'd love the fact that you're interested and that will help you with understanding various disabilities. The last thing is understanding the impact on the body because some developmental disabilities like autism syndrome can have a huge impact on how people dress. Why is that? Because they have sensory sensitivity. So tags that may not bother you could really have an impact on someone's day if they're dressing with autism syndrome. And if they're a child in school, something as simple as that can change an A student to a D or F student because they're not able to focus. And the teacher is thinking, oh, this child is a child that's not focused. This child is not able to be in a normal classroom. And it's just the tag in the shirt. There's a great brand called Independence Day Clothing that actually makes the clothing that there is no wrong way to put it on. Inside out is right. So if the child messes it up, they still get it right. And I love that. It even has a GPS slot so that if the child somehow gets lost or is not where they, you expect them to be, it'll actually track them as well. I wanted to talk a little bit more about if you were a disability stylist for me. Shoes of Prey is a great option for me and other people that have issues with their feet. Shoes of Prey is, it allows you to go online and actually customize and design your own shoes. And like I said, for me, let's try the pointer. Will it work? Oh, yes. For me, the vamp is super important. The vamp is the top of that toe box that for me, if it's not long enough, I won't have the balance, the, the balance that I need in order to wear the shoes that I love. So if you were, if I came to you and I said, hey, I need some help finding great shoes, then the first thing you would want to do is you would want to consider the construction of the shoe, consider my issues, and then look at how that actually works together and what, what questions and problems I would need to solve. So what makes this accessible and easy to put on and take off for me? Well, for me, I need a longer vamp, at least three inches on the toe box. And for a T-strap, I wore these specifically because the toe box is a little bit shorter, but aesthetically for me, having the T-strap covers a lot of the surgery marks that I have on my feet. So I wore those to show you that. This gives me extra support. So having that strap for support is also important for me. What makes it smart? For me, it's not gonna cause harm. A, I'm not gonna fall 
and potentially really hurt myself. And I know that sounds kind of funny, but that could be a real issue for me if I'm wearing the wrong shoes. I have a person that I dress. She is born, she was a congenital amputee above the knees. And if I don't put her in the right shoes, she's on red carpet, she's everywhere. If she slides, she could seriously injure herself. So that's also important to know. And fashionable. These work with my lifestyle. They're not six inches. I can wear them to teach. I can wear them to speak. I can wear them going out. They are also something that works with, you know, it's just what I like. So it's something that is accessible, smart, fashionable for me. At this point, do you have any questions? Yes. These shoes, well, I only know U.S. dollars, so they're only like 200 and they're below $250. Yes, we're going to talk about that. That's a great question because people with disabilities, and these are the latest statistics for you, people with disabilities have friends and family, right? So although people with disabilities may be, some people may be on a limited budget, Friends and family combined with people with disabilities is a potential disposable, just disposable income of $1 trillion. People come to me all the time because they don't know what to buy for that loved one that has a disability. And so to answer your question, yes. And I am a, I am a believer of cost per wear. Do any of you know what I mean by that? When it comes to styling? So a lot of people say, hey, I'm going to run to a fast fashion store and I'm going to buy this thing for $20 and I'm going to wear it twice. And I say, why not buy a $300 shoe and keep it for years? When you buy modern classics, you can keep them. Cost per wear is how much you're paying each time you wear it. If you buy something for $20 and you wear it twice, you're actually paying more for it than if you bought it for $200 and wear it within a year several times, you know, even like 20, even if you only wore 20 times, you're still paying less per wear. So it's, what I have to do is change the perception of what is expensive and what is not expensive. And for people with disabilities, especially seated body types, there are some things that just cannot be compromised. And, and that's real because you want people to be safe. So who is the customer with a disability? Do any of you have any thoughts? Any thoughts? Kids, women, Kids, men. Women, men. Everybody. Anybody. Perfect answer. It's the only minority group that crosses everything. Age, gender, it doesn't matter. Most people think of disability, the image in your mind, do you automatically get, think of a senior citizen or someone that may be elderly or more mature? Anyone get that image? It's okay if you do. That's okay. Do any of you think specifically of children? Who do you think of? Since you shake your hand, I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I agree. Everyone, children. Yes, it can be anyone. Yes. Would be the maybe the veterans. Ah, very good. People who went to war and probably come back with a disability of some form. Yeah, and that customer for me has been the one that's taught me the most. I have a quick story for you. There was a police officer. His name was Rolo, and he, I'm sure that was a nickname, but anyway. He actually was 6'5", loved suits, loved dressing. In the middle of a police chase, he had a stroke crashed, entire left side of his body paralyzed. His girlfriend brings me in to help. He had never heard of pants for wheelchair users because now he could only use one side of his body. Can anyone guess, just guesstimate how long it took Rolo to get dressed, to even put on a pair of pants after his paralysis, maybe say the first year? An hour? Hmm? An hour? You're absolutely right. An hour. Pants. How long did it take you today? Yeah, yeah, you're just like, doo -doo -doo, something you don't even think about. Imagine someone like that. He literally wept when 
I introduced him to designs for people with disability. He wept. And the line that I introduced him to was Izzy Camilleri's IZ collection, which she's put on hold for right now, but that collection allowed him to dress with dignity and independence, and it allowed him to do it on his own in less than 10 minutes. That's mind-blowing, to go from an hour. Do you ever see people with disabilities, especially wheelchair users in sweats? Sweatsuits, uh, track, very casual, played down. Or if you do see them in wheelchairs, maybe the clothing is ill-fitting or twisted. That's because, like I was pointing out earlier, it's not designed for that seated body type. So let's talk a little bit about the myths surrounding these customers. The thing that I always hear is, have any of you seen this online before? This is a picture that floats around a lot. It's from a company in Italy. The thing I hear most is people with disabilities are not interested in fashion. They're not interested. Human beings are not interested in fashion. That's the first myth that's surrounding. That's not true. Can we settle that today amongst ourselves? So if you just happen to walk past someone at an event and you hear them saying that people with disabilities are not interested in fashion because they have disabilities, kind of peek your head and be like, oh, pardon, um, actually that's not true. People with disabilities are very much interested in fashion. The next is, oh, this is too niche. This is too niche, too small, not enough money. Well, we dress dogs, cats, ferrets. We even dress snakes. I am not even lying. Have you seen the collection? People have clothes for their pet snakes. Seriously? That's niche. And there are more clothing options right now for pets than they actually are for people with seated body types. It blows my mind every single time I, I say that because I've been saying that now for probably 15 years and it hasn't changed. So, but I'm an optimist. I think it will. Great point brought out earlier, can't afford to shop. We have family members. Think about children. Parents and grandparents are just looking for anything that they can find. A question I often get is, where is your collection? Why haven't you designed something? Well, people don't know me, and they want to wear clothing that their friends are wearing. Children don't want to wear clothing by a person they've never heard of. So that's why I continue to talk about the need for it, because people want to wear clothing that makes them feel, and I'm going to use this quote again because I don't really know what this means, but we use it a lot, normal. People want to feel like their peers. And even if they want to feel artistic and special and unique, for the most part, they want to feel like they fit in. How does that play into my argument for adaptive clothing for people that maybe people don't know those designers? If you pair that with a high and low, or if you pair that with something that is on trend, you can bring in trend any way you want to. Glasses, hairstyles, different color schemes, you can always bring in a trend. But if you're not dressing them in something that makes them feel like their peers, people are going to often want to reject it. You know what people have said to me behind closed doors, and yes, I'm putting them on blast without naming the companies. They've said, oh, so you want to dress the retarded. Oh, you think people want to see those people in our brand? A lot of brands don't want people with disabilities in their clothing because of the perception of the person with a disability. And it's just a fact. That's not what we do. I contacted a mall near where I, I live because I'm always taking clients there. Spend a lot of money there. So I said, have you ever thought about having advertising that actually features a person in a wheelchair or with crutches, something that makes, or an amputee, makes people feel like you want them there, especially since we spend a ton of money there? And they said, well, we have a very specific market segment that we're targeting. And I thought about it, and I was like, okay, you get more bees with honey, you get more bees with honey, so don't... Don't say anything that you're going to regret. And I said, uh, can you clarify specific target? Very straightforward, not people with disabilities. Because in her mind, that was not what they wanted. Ironically, those were people that were actually spending their money at her location. 
Oh, it looks like we have a word cut off. This is a, a pet peeve of mine. I started talking about it a little earlier. Including people on the runway is not enough. Imagine seeing a runway show. What's your favorite brand, may I ask? Do you have a favorite brand? No, anyone with a favorite brand and you just look for their runway shows, you're like, countdown. The photos are coming out. Okay, so, cuss, runway show. You love it. You see someone that fits your body type, looks just like you, they're on the runway, and then you go to buy it, and they're like, oh no, you can't really wear that. That was just, you know, we didn't make anything for your body type. We just kind of put that on the runway. Do you know what I mean by that? I know we're in the era of see now, buy now, consumer-driven fashion shows. That's what people with disabilities, when they're used as props. I'm just gonna keep it completely real with you. I have no idea what this is. And I know they were trying to include or be inclusive, but true inclusivity means putting people with disabilities in clothing that they actually can wear. And even if you have a fashion show that's more artistic and you're just telling this beautiful story and you know how there are exaggerated pieces and things are just more creative, at least make it a part of the theme where they can actually wear the clothing. Am I making any sense whatsoever? with regards to how that makes a difference, because continuing to per perpetuate those myths really causes the breakdown between reality and wanting to get a viral video and really wanting to serve the needs of the population. This is Kate, she's a veteran, and I work with Kate a lot. And as you see, she's wearing a prosthetic, a prosthetic cover. This is a unique, UNYQ is the company. And this is one of the ways in which tech has become a game changer. Prosthetic hands and limbs that would normally cost forty-two to $50,000, you can now get for 50. And they work. And it's something that people can get printed by a 3D printer. Not telling you anything new, I'm sure, because you're so in the know with that, but that is a huge game changer. Think independence and dignity. So prosthetics is one way. A wearable that I like is Dot. It's a Braille smartwatch that's not super expensive. It's kind of something that is the same as like an Apple watch but it's braille and so that they will have the independence. Because normally this stuff is really expensive. And, and I'm just kind of talking and hitting on wearables and prosthetic covers and I wanna get to this. You guys can look at fabrics that change colors and that make it possible for people to tell, you know, basically their heart rate and all of this, but that hasn't been the true tech game changer. The true tech game changer for people with disabilities has been blogs. And I just used my blog as an example. It's been a place where people with disabilities can come out of, the, out of the shadows. That's what tech has done. Tech has given people with disabilities an opportunity on social media to tell their own stories. You get to see them, even if you don't want to. You get to see what it's like for someone who lives with one limb, for someone who ambulates with a wheelchair. You get to see what it's like you get to hear them talk about what it's like dating as a little woman. You, things that would have normally have been just in the shadows, this is the beauty of technology. Not only does it provide an opportunity for them to tell their story, but to connect to other people within their same groups and find support and community for a lot of people that have felt ostracized. So this is something that for me, in my mind, after watching this for 25 years, this is the real game changer. Technology allowing people to tell their stories, to become a part of society, and for a lot of ladies and gentlemen, to become influencers, to become people that can make a living from their homes, telling their stories, sharing things that work for them. If it feels anticlimactic, it's not. For you, it's old hat, 
but for someone, especially I think often about our own laws where I'm from, we had this one beautiful, horrible thing. I'm being facetious when I say beautiful. It was called the ugly laws, where you could literally be arrested if you were considered to be offensive. The way that we got the Americans with Disabilities Act, there were a couple of friends. One gentleman only communicated with sounds. He had Down syndrome. His other friend had an injury from the war. So for whatever reason, he could understand him. The gentleman just wanted pancakes. I guess that would be like a crepe here, but kind of like pancakes, crepes. That's all he wanted. He wanted that for his birthday. So he went into a store. We had no ramp, so he had to kind of pick him up to get the chair and pick the chair up and bring it in. They're set. Whew, that takes about 20, 30 minutes right there. They're set, ready to go, and guess what? The waitress calls the police because the gentleman who has Down syndrome happened to drool a little bit. She said it was unsightly, kicked him out of the restaurant. They went around to about 32 states to help change that law because that's how big social media is. 2009 was like the big time for social media and for people to start vlogging and blogging and telling their stories. This is our 2009 within the disability community. Right now, I get calls from companies on a regular basis. Some want NDAs, so I can't mention names, but others like media companies will call me and BuzzFeed will say, hey, I want, I want something to go viral. So they want, they featured, well, Lolo, the second young lady here. Oh, I have a pointer. They just, she just did a BuzzFeed story on dating with a disability. And another one of the people that work with me, she just did another one because this is Pride Month. And so they're wanting to do this, but her specific words were, we need this to go viral. So right now it's this thing. And I just want you to know that maybe something that's old hat to you is really changed the world that I live in and the world for the people that I work with. And I think that's a really important note because texting wasn't developed for any of us, right? It was developed for who? People who have what? The inability to, to speak. We all use it. We all use it like it was made for us. In one of my communication courses, a gentleman said, a man made this because he knows that men don't want to talk all the time and he made it for men so that they could communicate without having to talk and then they could effectively ghost when they don't want to answer a question. And that was a real thought of this guy. He was like, oh, this was definitely created by a man for men. He was wrong, but I'm glad that he owns the texting in a way that he feels that it works for him. Why am I sharing that? I'm sharing that because smart design from the beginning is just smart design. So using technology to create limbs, using technology to have wearable fabrics that can be intuitive and, and figure out ways in which to make people's lives easier is great. Creating apps that create social opportunities for people is also wonderful. But at the end of the day, I want to tell you about this company. This is Split Heel. It's the only 3D printed heel that's around right now. There are other 3D printed shoes. Adidas is jumping in this whole 3D printed sole and that sort of thing. But no one has really taken the plunge like this shoe. And it hasn't taken off the way that I think it will. Do any of you have any ideas as to why a fully 3D printed shoe may have difficulty? Comfort. You can customize it but the comfort is not there. And there's a limitation right now with style. So if this is something that you're thinking about, this is a completely open field. Just to give you an idea, if we wanted to study denim and we were in a class, I teach fashion marketing, and I said, okay, let's go find some business information, let's go find all of the numbers on a set number of denim companies, right, denim brands. So my students can go to Dun & Bradstreet, they can go to all of these software programs, and they can find all of this information. Right now, adaptive clothing and clothing for people with disabilities is still so new that companies like Brian's Shoes, Split Shoes, or Split Heels, you can't even find numbers. So you know how people, when we think of business, we think of the pie? The pie chart, and you just want to get your little slither of the pie? There's so much pie right now so much pie that we could each have probably three, four pieces. 
I don't even eat pie like that, but I'm just trying to make the point that this is not something where it's super crowded, where you cannot make an impact or a difference. Inclusivity. This is how you can help meet the needs of people with disabilities. It's really simple. Acknowledge, value, listen. You can't meet the needs of a customer that you don't even acknowledge exist. I don't particularly care for snakes. I would never think to acknowledge a snake as a fashion customer. I'm sorry if you are a snake owner. I am not being biased. I'm just stating a fact. I do not think of snakes top of mind when I think of even dressing pets. So I would have never been able to meet the need of a snake in dressing a snake. It wasn't top of mind. So simply acknowledging makes a difference. The second thing is to make a value decision. Hmm, I see the customer. I value this potential customer. And now this customer is someone that I can say, I want to create amazing marketing, branding, design, lifestyle, just like able body brands. That's making, that value deci decision will actually help you stay away from things like normal stereotypes that tend to kind of get people stumbling. And finally, listen to the customers. Because just like able body dressers, everyone has different needs. I'm looking at all of you, and I will venture to say that every person in this room is probably below the age of 90. We are very different. We have very different needs. Everyone is dressed differently. Hair is different. The way you're expressing yourself is different. It's no different within the disability community. It's diverse. It's expressive. And although I can't go into everything within this time frame, I just wanted to introduce you and get you thinking. And what's so interesting about this, the bells and whistles that people normally associate with technology like, oh, it does this and this app does that. We don't even need that right now. We just need to continue to create community. We just need opportunities to be able to tell the story of a person with a disability in a way that's unique and authentic. So if you're like super techie and you're like, look, I was looking for something like a lot deeper than that. For us, social media, these creating apps and having things where we can come together, that is the need right now taking people with disabilities out of the shadows and bringing them to the forefront as valued fashion customers. If you want to find out more information or if you want to ask me questions or if you want to say, hey, you didn't mention this or you didn't mention that, I'd love to hear from you, curatable.com. But now I want to take your questions. Do you have any thoughts or any ideas about anything that I said? You can even disagree because I'd love to hear your perspective and it may bring something to the conversation that I failed to bring out today. Any questions, thoughts, ideas? Yes, and then I'll come to you. Don't you think that also there is not a lot of um, propositions for disabled people because of the problems with insurance, like designers being afraid that their um, specific clothes that they created for disabled people are not um, are not really fitting uh, disabled people and will hurt them even more. That's a really good question. That was actually one of my first case studies in graduate school when I went back to study this. And it was actually what I found interviewing about 100 designers is that it was not an aesthetic issue. They didn't, even, they didn't even think about that. They were just like, some of them were like, well, this is not our perceived customer. This is not how we want to represent our brand. And then others just simply said, I never thought about it. And with limited marketing dollars, I don't think that that's something that we're going to be able to do. So it just wasn't what was top of mind for them, and it wasn't a priority. The brands that tend to make this a priority now are brands that are run by people that have had experiences or have family members that directly impact their, their perception. We had a gentleman here in the center. They had a question. Yeah. 
Yeah, you said before that the, um, the market is not so developed. Why? I, I just don't understand at all why it's not so developed. I know. That's a really good question. The only thing that I've come up with in two decades is that I can only give you what people have said to me. They don't want to connect a lot of times the image of their brand to a person with a disability, but it still goes back to the perception. And the fact that the market is not developed also has a lot to do with people not really even knowing that people with disabilities actually go to the gym, work out, date, what? have children, you know what I mean? Like, so the perception of the person with a disability is changing. I've seen a huge change in the last three years, and I think it's going to pick up because now we're seeing more people with disabilities in commercials and films and different things like that, and I, I think it's just acknowledging. And I can say this as a black woman living in America for years, makeup colors, don't judge me, this is all me today, so if it's not right, it's not because the makeup colors are bad, it's because this is not my gift. I asked to see yesterday, I was like, you know anybody can do my makeup because it's gonna be a horrible thing. But there was a time where I could go to a store and look at a makeup brand like MAC and everything I put on was red. Well, I'm Native American and black and so I have yellow undertones and red undertones. So I need something that's gonna kinda tap into both of those, but it's only within the last decade that I've had that. Women that are more voluptuous or fuller size, taller men, still have similar issues with finding clothing that's fashionable for them. So I think it's just a progression of people going, hey, we're here and we've got money. Does that address your question? Okay. Hi, my Hi. name is Christian Killery, and um, Hi. I, I have a family which has a long tradition with the army. So uh -huh. the notions of dignity and honor are really big and important to, to my family and I. So I was wondering, have you been approached by maybe the government or associations dedicated to the care of veterans, you know, to give them back the question of dignity and honor? And if yes, how? That's a really good question. A lot of people, that work within our governmental system, keep their head down and they're working. Even if they're working with veterans, a lot of people have said, oh, veterans don't want that. My best interaction has been with family members like you, someone from the family saying, can you help us? And in that case, the first thing that I do is, for seated body types, is we reframe the closet. That's the first step we take, and that's what I do when I'm asked. Because if you are normally standing and everything in your closet is here, and then you are in a wheelchair, the first thing is you're constantly gonna be reminded of the life that you had. So we get that closet so that we bring the bars down so everything is eye length. We adjust everything around it. We find out, we get things out of the closet that will no longer work. So by the time that they're home from the hospital, that we have a closet that is actually going to work for them. And a lot of times when the person is ready, which doesn't often happen right away, because there's, there's a lot that you go through when you lose a limb or when your body is shaped differently because of a disability. So once they're ready, we usually go on a shopping trip and I accompany them and I help them work through the process and show them what silhouettes work well for them, based on their lifestyle, and it's usually more productive than trying to ram everything in at once, but a lot of the governmental agencies are not, they don't even, that's not even something that they can conceive of. And when I've reached out to them over the years, I've constantly received, oh, no one needs this service, no one asks me for it. They don't know it exists, so, but that's a great question. Did that answer your question? Yes, you did. Yes, awesome. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. I was wondering if you could share some specific numbers with us as far as the disability fashion market. See, Sissy, I would love to share some specific, you mean like of the people? Yeah. One in five people in the world have a disability. So senior citizens alone throughout the world, around 300 million. In addition to that, so you have seniors or elderly, you have about a billion people, and these numbers are according to the U.S. Census Bureau, some statistics from the Canadian board, and this alone makes it not a niche market. And in addition to that, 
you have people every day coming back from the war. And because census is only taken, at least where we are, every four to six years, there are people that are not even right now that know about who's living with and without a disability. As far as the business numbers and how, what the market is, it's so underdeveloped. I can tell you that the brands that are doing the best right now would be ABL Denim, which is a brand that is actually sold Walmart. It's sold in Walmart, which is a big deal because Walmart is not considered a fashion brand, but they sell more fashion products than many of the other retail stores which are suffering right now in many ways. And then you have the Tommy Hilfiger line that's doing really well. I don't know, have you heard of Zappos, Z-A? P-P-O-S, Zappos is a shoe brand. They're adding a complete Zappos adaptive. They're starting to add a whole brand. Amazon is now starting to tap into this so that they've discovered that, hey, we don't have brick and mortars, so now people can have access to come and be in the store on Amazon. And there, it's, I think that's the way that it's going to go, especially since brick and mortar is having a difficult time kind of bringing it in, and we're not getting a lot of retail space dedicated to it. But I think as Tommy goes, I think the rest of the industry will follow, but it's still very new. It's only two. I don't have any other numbers more than that because it is so segregated that there are, like I was saying, I can't send someone to go get numbers because no one reports numbers. Can I tell you, though, a main issue that designers do have that are adaptive designers? Which, if you're making an app or you're doing something and you want to address a problem, a real problem that I see when I'm consulting adaptive designers is that the designers do not, they, they can't scale the product. Do you know what I mean by that? Their manufacturing numbers are so low, it makes it so much more expensive for them to develop the product. So if you connected with a larger company that could then, or you could even bring several companies together under one design house that will have a segment that's just for adaptive, and then you can crank it out, then it's scalable. And you're able to bring the prices down as a result of that. Thank you. Did you have one more question? Yes, I do have one last question, maybe. So I was wondering, as of today, what is the next step? What do you need today to get to the next step and expand what you're doing on a more global scale? The first step is I need each of you to share with one other person. That would be a great first step. Keep the conversation going. And when opportunities arise and you see ways to solve problems, that would be another great step. And if there is anyone that you know that needs a consultant that can come out and help, I'm always happy to do that. But more importantly, I think each one telling one and really being involved in your community and now that you're aware of it, I think that would make a huge difference because that keeps it grassroots. Thank you, guys.